This morning I have the pleasure of being joined by some of my colleagues who've been helping us with this fight during the pandemic from the beginning. So we have Franklin County Health Commissioner and we have our four hospital partners as well as Central Ohio, Central Ohio Primary Care Physicians. Joining me today just to provide you with the update is the Health Commissioner from Franklin County Public Health, Joe Mazzola, Dr. Mark Herbert from Mount Carmel Health System, Dr. Andy Thomas and Dr. Veena Satya Priya from OSU Wexner Medical Center, Dr. Rustin Morse from Nationwide Children's Hospital, and Dr. Amy M. from Ohio Health. We are also joined today by Dr. Larry Blosser from Central Ohio, uh, Central Ohio Primary Care Physicians. So again, thanks for all of you for being here. As we enter into our 18th month in our battle against COVID-19 here in Columbus and Franklin County, we are now faced with an ever-changing pandemic landscape and new challenges such as vaccine hesitation and dangerous variants that threatens the progress we've made. Here to give you an update on the current situation of COVID-19 here in our community is Franklin County Health Commissioner Joe Mazzola. Joe? Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Good morning, everyone. Appreciate very much the opportunity to join my colleagues and the opportunity to speak here this morning. I also want to thank our elected officials, community organizations, and residents of Franklin County for their continued support. We want to start by sharing some current trends here in Franklin County as it relates to COVID-19 cases, vaccinations, and the most recent public health guidance. In the last four weeks, the percentage of new positive COVID-19 cases, which is the positivity rate here in Franklin County, has more than doubled from 1.3% to 2.8%. In the last two weeks, the seven day moving average case rate has gone up 56%. From July 21st to the 27th, it was 36 per 100,000 residents. One week later from July 27th through August 2nd, it has now reached 56 per 100,000 residents. There's no doubt that COVID-19 in Franklin County is getting worse. We believe the significant increase in cases in the last few weeks can be attributed to the Delta variant, which is extremely contagious. With cases rising, the number of residents getting vaccinated, however, has not kept pace. As of August 2nd, only 53.5% of all Franklin County residents have started their vaccination series, and just over 50% have, are fully vaccinated. Though this rate is higher than the state's, it is, lags behind what other communities across the country have been able to achieve. Vaccination is the most important public health action to end the COVID-19 pandemic. We continue to have strong evidence that the COVID-19 vaccine is safe and effective. Getting vaccinated helps reduce the spread of the virus in our community. But as importantly, it also prevents severe illness, hospitalization, and death. Almost all who are now hospitalized or die from COVID-19 are unvaccinated. Despite seeing case numbers increase, however, the number of deaths are down almost 70%, which is further proof that getting vaccinated is the best thing you can do to protect yourself, others, and our community. In addition to the rising number of cases, mostly in those unvaccinated, there have been a small percentage of vaccinated people who get COVID-19 and breakthrough infections and unknowingly may be contagious, again, mostly attributed to the Delta variant. According to the CDC, because of our current rising case rates, Franklin County is now designated as an area of substantial transmission of COVID-19. That is up from the moderate transmission level from last week. In areas of, of substantial transmission, the CDC recommends that everyone including those who are fully vaccinated, wear a mask in, in public indoor settings to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. Universal masking in public and employer settings can break this transmission rate, save lives, and help our schools and businesses continue to remain open. Last week, based on current local trends and CDC guidance, Franklin County Public Health and Columbus Public Health issued recommendations that our K-12 schools adopt universal masking for all teachers, staff, visitors, and students, regardless of vaccination status, to maintain and maximize full-time in-person learning. Given the infectious nature of this Delta variant that we're seeing here in our community, we need various layers of protection. Think of it like riding in a car. Your seatbelt is that first layer of protection, that vaccination. 
The second are, the, are your airbags or wearing your face covering. And we also need to all, continue to remind our community and stress frequent hand washing, staying home when you're sick, and of course, keeping a safe social distance from others. I want to end by saying we know that this information, our community could be discouraged by hearing this, but we know, you know, we know what works. We, we do have good strategies to reverse these trends. There is potential for this to get worse before it gets better. However, if we can all continue to get vaccinated and wear a mask in public, we will be able to reverse the trends here in our community. So now with that, I think it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andy Thomas from the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here and thank you, uh, Joe, for sharing that information. I've been asked to share a little information about hospitalized cases, uh, both in the state of Ohio as well as here in what we call Zone 2, which is the third of the state that includes Central Ohio, Southern Ohio, and Southeastern Ohio. Uh, we've seen a significant increase over the past month in patients with active COVID-19 being in the hospital. Uh, the state is now approaching 800 patients actively in the hospital with COVID-19. If you look back on July 9th, we were at 200 patients with active COVID-19 in the hospital. So in the past month, a fourfold increase. Even just two weeks ago, we were at uh, under 400 uh, patients in the hospital. Here in zone two, which includes the Franklin County area, as I mentioned, and, and areas south of us and southeast of us, we uh, today have at reached just under 200 patients with active COVID-19 in the hospital. In the last seven days, that's a 51% increase from just a week ago. Back in early July, we were down in the range of 40 patients in the hospital. So a four to five fold increase in hospitalizations just in the past month. Now the good news is if you look in zone two back in December, we were at around 1200 patients in the hospital. So 200 is certainly far less than that. However, if we have unmitigated spread of this virus through our communities, some percentage of those that are unvaccinated are going to get sick enough to need to be in our hospitals. What we really want to avoid is the situation that we're currently seeing in the state of Florida. I was on calls yesterday with individuals who manage hospitals there. Those hospitals are now beginning again to limit elective surgeries, to reduce the care that they provide to everybody else because COVID-19 patients are overwhelming their hospitals. In Florida currently, they have more patients in many hospitals than they had at the peak of the pandemic last winter. We know how we can avoid that situation here in central Ohio, across the state of Ohio, and that's getting vaccinated. It's your best way to be protected from the most serious complications of this virus. That's being in the hospital, being in the ICU, being on the ventilator, or God forbid, passing away. What we wanna do is make sure we're reducing that risk for those that are at risk for severe disease by making sure they're all vaccinated. Good news is for in the state of Ohio for folks over age 65, we're well over 80% that are vaccinated, but it needs to be higher. Those folks in the 20, 30 and 40 age group really need to take this seriously to make sure that they're not getting a case that gets them in the hospital or getting a case of COVID-19 that they give to someone else who's at high risk for serious complications. I'm gonna turn the microphone over now to Dr. Veena Satapriya, who's one of our critical care anesthesia physicians at Ohio State. She's gonna share a patient story uh, from the front line and, and what we're seeing in our hospitals uh, across the city. Veena. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for allowing me to come here to speak today. Um, I was actually asked to provide a story um, about a patient with COVID-19 that I took care of um, in the past few weeks at Ohio State at, in the cardiovascular intensive care unit. This gentleman, he's 28 years old. Um, I was given permission by his family to talk about his story today. Um, he's 28. He has no past medical history. He's unvaccinated um, and but other than that no, nothing else to uh, write home about with his health he was coming back from a vacation with his family out west um, with his wife and his parents um, spent a lot of time hiking very active guy on his drive home he started to feel chills by the time he got to Chicago he felt very unwell 
uh, went home, went to bed. The next morning he got up, felt even worse, went to the ED, got himself tested, tested positive for COVID-19. Again, he's young, healthy. He was sent home to self-isolate, supportive care, um, and he was given a pulse oximeter to monitor his oxygen levels um, at home. Uh, over the next few days at home, his work of breathing went up. He started to continue to deteriorate. The number on his oxygen monitor went down and it hit to below 90. And so he knew he had to go into the hospital. Um, by that time, his wife had also tested positive. She was also unvaccinated and was um, at home isolating as well. His parents both are vaccinated. His parents are both very uh, strong proponents of getting vaccinated in their community. His mother drove him to the hospital. Um, and one of the last things he said to her in that drive was he wished he'd gotten vaccinated. Um, got to the hospital, his local hospital, and in the words of the family, everything very quickly spiraled downward from there. Um, he was at that hospital for five days, got all the appropriate treatment for COVID-19, um, continued to require more and more oxygen support, support to help his breathing to the point where he needed a ventilator and a breathing tube and a ventilator. Even with the breathing tube, even with maximal ventilator support, even with having to um, be flipped onto his belly to kind of help with his oxygen levels and improve the aeration in his lungs, he, um, his oxygen levels remained dangerously low um, and he was critically ill. And so that's when he got transported to Ohio State to our CVICU, our cardiovascular intensive care unit for evaluation for a life support device called ECMO. ECMO is, uh, it stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It's a modified heart and lung bypass machine, similar to what cardiac surgeons use in the operating room. Um, and it's, a comp it's made up of a series of tubes, a pump and an oxygenator. Um, it requires a surgery to get um, implanted into a patient by our cardiac surgeons. And it requires a very specialized team in the CVICU to manage these patients who are this critically ill once they get placed on it. We use it in patients who are so sick, um, despite whatever conventional medical treatments that we have, um, that are just, they're just not enough and they're just not working. So it's usually a matter of life and death choice, quite frankly, to put someone on ECMO. And so um, we decided to put him on ECMO a day after he got to us. Um, since then, he has had the breathing tube removed from his mouth, but it is in his tracheostomy. He still requires the ventilator and ECMO support. Um, he's very critical, he's stable, uh, but he's very sick and he's still sitting there fighting for his life. Um, so his wife and his parents are really beside themselves right now. They're feeling helpless. They have so many questions. Is he gonna live? If he's gonna live, what is life gonna be like for this guy that just was out hiking the Red Rock in 115 degree heat? Um, four weeks ago. Uh, will he be able to support his family? Will he be able to grow his family? Is he going to need a lung transplant? Um, a lot of questions that we don't really know answers to yet. Um, and these are not unusual questions for any family to ask in an ICU about their loved ones. I think what makes this so heartbreaking for the family and for all the caregivers that care for him every day is um, his vaccination status and the fact that this could have been prevented. Um, the data suggests that the likelihood of a healthy vaccinated 28 year old getting this sick is very, very low. Um, even if he got a breakthrough inve infection at, as a vaccinated uh, person, he probably would not have been hospitalized or needed the ICU or a ventilator or ECMO. And we wouldn't be here today having this conversation about him. Um, so even as his wife and his family are struggling with the fact that this nightmare um, is, was preventable, potentially preventable, they are really determined to use this experience that they're having to encourage the community to go out and get vaccinated today, right now. Um, they understandably are under a lot of duress and they were not able to be here themselves, uh, but they did ask that I share a statement um, from them to the community. And this is from his wife with the help of his parents. Um, three weeks ago, we were happy, healthy, and had the usual everyday questions of what's for dinner, 
or when will get home when will we get home from work to see each other since then, since then our lives have been turned upside down and very uncertain with questions of will he make it through the night and how did he even get this sick we made a choice just like a lot of people did both of us are young and considered not to be at risk so we didn't see the urgency in getting vaccinated Today I think about that choice and I think of what my husband has gone through as well as our family. Getting vaccinated is a serious decision, but there are consequences for both choices. Not getting vaccinated could mean you and your family have to deal with the brutal side of COVID. Your family may have to experience the helplessness of feel, helpless feeling of waiting outside for news every few hours because they can't get to go in to see you that sinking feeling when the phone rings because it could be a nurse or a doctor telling them that your lungs aren't responding enough to the oxygen machine, or the fear of being one hour away from the hospital because they might not get there in time to see you through the window. These are all very real situations that have made the last three weeks feel like a terrible dream. We weren't prepared for, we weren't prepared for how sick he would be so fast and want to share his experiences to inform others of how devastating this virus can be, particularly if you do not get vaccinated. Um, so we, we wanted to share their struggle, the family struggles, and I do thank them for being so open and honest um, with all of us and communicating all this to the public. Um, but hopefully this is a message to the community to go out and get vaccinated right now. Um, even those of you who may not consider yourselves high risk, um, it's not really a gamble that's worth taking right now. Um, and that's all I have, so thank you. Thank you so much for sharing um, that real life story and why we're all here and why we've been encouraging people to get the vaccine. Um, people who are not vaccinated, you nor your loved ones should have to go through that when we have a tool that is very safe and very effective at reducing the chances of you having to be hospitalized with COVID-19, let alone die from COVID-19. So thank you so much and thank the family. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Herbert now, and he's gonna give us an update from Mount Carmel Health System and a little bit about the Delta variant. Thanks. Good morning. I wanted to spend a few minutes and talk a little bit about what's known currently about the COVID virus and especially the Delta variant. We've all been observing or participating in this COVID pandemic for the last 18 months, but it's really truly changed in the last three or, month, three or four months with the development of the COVID variant, the Delta variant, uh, and it has become now the most common COVID virus that's circulating in our communities. As mentioned earlier, the Delta variant is much more dangerous than the original COVID virus that was circulating a year ago. It's much more dangerous because it spreads more easily from one person to another. The number of virus particles that are harbored inside the body and released into the nearby atmosphere is much greater than with the standard virus. Therefore, more people can be infected from what we call an index case. When one person is infected in a room, it's much more likely to infect a large number of people in the room than the original COVID virus. We also have some uh, early information that says that the Delta variant makes people sicker faster. And some of our uh, anecdotal observations have been that the patients that we see in the hospital currently are probably younger and have fewer underlying medical problems. So the Delta variant is definitely attacking a younger, healthier population. If there's any good news, the good news is that vaccines are effective. It's important to recognize that the goal of a vaccine is always to prevent serious disease and death. And the COVID vaccines maybe among the best vaccines ever developed in preventing serious infection and death. They don't prevent all infections. There may be mild infections or even infections without symptoms. And we call those breakthrough infections if they occur after a fully vaccination. Now, 
What's important to recognize is that vaccines have benefits not only for an individual, but also for the community. If you're an individual who has received the vaccine, you are very unlikely to get a COVID infection. And at the same time, if that very rare situation would happen where you do develop a COVID infection after complete vaccination, it is very likely to be mild. You're not likely to end up in the hospital or in the ICU on the ventilator like the unfortunate story we just heard. But there's also a big benefit to the community. I spoke earlier about how the Delta variant produces so much virus that spreads about. If the community at large is all vaccinated, the number of times that that virus has the opportunity to divide is lessened. Every time a virus divides, there's a chance for a mutation. Every time a mutation happens, there's a chance that that makes the virus stronger. So I told you before, vaccine all works well for the Delta virus. That's very good news. We don't know what mutation will happen next. It's theoretically possible that a mutation could happen in the future that would prevent the current vaccines from working. So that would be a concern. So as you've heard here multiple times, the way that we prevent this pandemic from spreading farther has not changed. We all need to get vaccine for ourselves and for our community. We are now back in a powerful portion of the pandemic where we need to be masking whether we are vaccinated or not. Everyone should be masking indoors. We should be cautious about outdoor situations. If they're not appropriately distanced, we need to be cautious that there could be virus spread in that situation. This is how they discovered that the Delta virus can be spread from someone who's been vaccinated. In the recent pandemic, in the recent epidemic that was described in uh, Cape Cod a few weeks ago. So we know that not only do we need to mask indoors, we need to be very careful out of doors, especially with crowded events. So the way we prevent this illness has not changed. Vaccine, masking, distancing, careful hand washing. We should be doing all of these things as a routine part of our day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Herbert. And I should have mentioned, and most of you probably know him very well, but Dr. Herbert is an infectious disease specialist at Mount Carmel Health System. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rustin Morse um, from Chief Medical Officer at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And he will talk to us a little bit about what Nationwide Children's Hospital is seeing and the vaccine's impact on children. Rustin. Thank you, Mashika, and, and thank you, my colleagues. To my colleagues, I, it, it is actually mind-boggling after hearing my colleagues speak and hearing that patient story why someone would choose choose not to get vaccinated at this point. I mean, if, if you, you are rolling the dice with your life by choosing not to get vaccinated, and it has profound impacts not only on you and your family and society, but I'll talk about the children specifically here. So the, the impact on children from a COVID perspective, the direct impact remains fairly low, frankly. Children are not getting as sick as the adults. We are seeing children being hospitalized with COVID, but it's at a fairly low volume locally. Some parts of the country, that volume has increased back to their highest levels of what they saw last winter, but it's still low in comparison to uh, what the adult hospitals are feeling on the adult side. However, the indirect impact is profound. So we are about to head into another school year, and here we are again having discussions and debates over the whether or not we should mask, whether or not we should vaccinate. I want to remind you that children under 12 are not eligible for the vaccine. The only way they can be protected is if we as adults get vaccinated and if we and them, children, wear masks. It is imperative as we enter this school year that children are masking in school, masking indoors, and that anyone who is eligible for vaccines gets vaccinated. If we do not do that, we run the risk of having another situation like we had last year where schools start closing, where children have to be home, and that has dramatic impacts on their health and well-being and dramatic impacts on their mental health and their behavioral health. 
It is a national crisis if we do not get people vaccinated from a pediatric perspective to get the children back in school and keep them in school with as much of a regular lifestyle that they are accustomed to and they deserve. And it is on us because we are the adults, so we have the power to choose to get vaccinated. We have the power to influence our children to wear masks and to wear masks ourselves. I also want to mention that we're having a national crisis in pediatric health care right now. It, we are seeing unprecedented volumes of admitted pediatric patients independent of COVID. We are seeing children admitted with viruses that we typically see in the winter. We've never seen them in the summer at unprecedented volumes. Many of our children's hospitals across the country are effectively bursting at the seams. They are at capacity. Children's hospitals during COVID served as a, a pop-off valve for adult systems. We were willing to partner with adult systems to take adult patients. We can't do that now. So if the adult hospitals start getting increased volumes of COVID, they can no longer look to the children's hospitals as a pop-off valve. We are at capacity. That is coupled with national nursing shortages, both nationally and locally. So what we're experiencing here in Columbus is we are full. We have never been at the capacity we've been at in the summer. We are seeing typical winter volumes in August. Feels like it should be snowing soon. And we are short nurses. So we're being very challenged on how to continue to provide highly effective, safe care, given the situation that we're seeing. So again, to me, the, the biggest impact we have and the most important message I can provide to you is we're heading into another academic year. And if you want to put the children first, and we should all want to put our children first, we need to all get vaccinated and we need to wear masks. The power is in our hands. And if you heard that story and you choose not to get vaccinated, that patient's story, it, to me, it's absolutely mind boggling. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morse. And now I would like to invite Dr. Amy M to the podium. Um, Dr. M is the Vice President of Quality and Patient Safety and Critical Care uh, and a Critical Care Specialist at Ohio Health, and she's going to give us an update from Ohio Health. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, and to all the other speakers today. Thank you for sharing the message that so desperately needs to be shared with our community. Uh, so far, I agree with everything that has been said, and I'd like to try to uh, shift the story a little bit and tell you what it looks like inside the hospital, much as Dr. Morse just did uh, with respect to the children's hospitals. As Dr. Thomas said, our hospitals are seeing increasing volumes of COVID-19 patients every day, and he told you about the relative quadrupling of the numbers over a very, very short period of time, and that is exactly what we're seeing in our hospitals across the city. As you've just heard also, our sickest patients are now substantially younger than they were last winter. We do have 80-year-olds, but we have a lot more 50, 60, and 40-year-olds uh, who are in the hospital seriously ill with COVID, many of them just as ill as the patient that Dr. Satapriya just described to you. The Delta variant is a very big ongoing threat, especially to the unvaccinated. We are hearing from our sickest patients when we ask them why they didn't get vaccinated that they just didn't think it would happen to them. And that's the trick here, none of us knows. We know what our risk factors are, but none of us knows if the disease might hit us mildly, moderately, or severely, which is why we have to worry. Our hospital teams are very weary. You've heard us describe the staffing shortages we're dealing with and the fact that the pandemic has already lasted 18 months and right now there's no immediate end in sight. And um, as Dr. Herbert cited, new variants may very well continue to emerge. It is very hard for our care teams emotionally when they see patients coming in with COVID and they know that their diseases were largely preventable. This, these same teams are also experiencing unusually high volumes of non-COVID patients. Very similar to what Dr. Morse said about the pediatric population, we're seeing this with the adult populations, largely related to care that was delayed um, during the actual last surge. They are very ill. The acuity is higher than ever. Our staff is in short supply and they are weary. The whole country is experiencing these staffing challenges, and it's not to un unique to Columbus nor to healthcare. The challenge is ongoing, and it makes it extremely difficult for us to anticipate that even more COVID positive patients may be coming our way over the next few months. Lastly, we want to encourage everyone 
in the community to do what they can to help turn the tide of this pandemic. Wave four has started, there's no doubt about it. It is now up to us to control how large this wave gets. Vaccination, masking, social distancing, and hand hygiene all remain the mainstays of action that we need to take in order to slow down this surge. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. M, and thanks to all of my colleagues who have joined us today. And just to summarize what you heard is the pandemic is not over. We have several tools that we can all use, and it's everyone's responsibility to use them. That's to get yourself vaccinated, and if you have been vaccinated, encourage someone who is not vaccinated to get vaccinated, and to mask up, especially when you're indoors. So I know you're all wondering, well, why did we bring you here? to tell you the situation. And so here it goes. Um, starting immediately, Columbus Public Health and Franklin County Public Health are issuing an indoor mask advisory. This is an advisory, it's not an order, and it's not a mandate. And the reason why it's not an order or a mandate is because of State Senate Bill 22, which prohibits us from doing any order that would be a blanket um, order to the whole population. But we are encouraging all of you and all of the residents of Franklin County Public Health, when they are indoors, whether they're vaccinated or not, to put a mask on. That includes businesses, that includes um, any healthcare facility, which they should already be masking up, and that includes going into restaurants. When you're not eating and drinking, we want you to have a mask on. That will help us spread, sorry, slow the spread of this virus in our community. We don't know how long this pandemic is going to last, and we don't know what the next variant will be and how serious it will be. But we do know what we can do to slow the spread of this virus, and that's to get vaccinated and to put a mask on. So we all appreciate you coming here today to join us. We hope you will share that message about our indoor mask advisory issued by Columbus Public Health and Franklin County Public Health. And my colleagues and I will be happy to answer any questions you have today. Yes, Luann. Have come out making mask wearing optional. Could you or the doctor from Children's Hospital address that? Um, what are you recommending to these schools? Do you want them to rethink that policy? Well, I'll take the question first. In terms of K through 12 making masking optional, um, Franklin County Public Health and Columbus Public Health did issue guidance to K through 12 schools over a week ago, I think, where we strongly recommended that K through 12 schools mask up indoors, everybody vaccinated and unvaccinated. Um, that is following the CDC guidance that we've all heard about. Um, we've had conversations with our superintendents here in Central Ohio, advising them of that, and also sharing with them that Senate Bill 22 really limits our ability to do an order or a mandate. Um, I don't know if Dr. Morris wants to address it or if Joe wants to say anything more to that. You know, I, I would just say it's really unfortunate that masks have become politicized. And this is the, the greatest, most effective tool, especially because we have children who are not vaccinated, not eligible for the vaccine yet, those under 12. This is the most effective tool we have in our armamentarium to keep those children in school this year. Every child, every staff member should be masking in schools. And, and frankly, the situation is significantly different than what it was a week or two weeks or three weeks ago. So I would welcome school districts to take a step back, reevaluate the situation, given the rapidly changing dynamics of the Delta variant. The game has changed and we need to have everyone masking in schools. So as kids and their parents are coming back from camp, they're coming back from vacations, is there any advice for them, like as school you know, starts in a few weeks, should they quarantine, should they keep away from people as they're coming back from those last vacations in the next couple of weeks? Well, you know, I would really argue that going on vacation is really no different than being here in Franklin County and going out and about. So if they wanted to um, reduce their chances of transmission, they might want to do things like get vaccinated if they're eligible, wear a mask when they're either here in town or vacationing, and then be mindful of their symptoms. You know, people who have breakthrough infections, many of them, not all, have very mild infections that they could easily dismiss as something other than COVID-19. So 
So I really want to encourage individuals who are vaccinated and are having any symptoms to rethink their activities and consider getting tested before they venture out and could potentially expose other people. Um, but in terms of before going back to school, um, you need to be mindful of your child's symptoms. And if you want to get your child tested, just to be sure, that's something you can do as well. But I would encourage you when they're out and about in town and when they're on vacation to wear a mask. That is something particularly those who are not eligible for the vaccine can do. Anyone else want to add to that? Just one, one more small, just one comment with that. I, I think it's really important that people understand things are different now. So two weeks ago, I was going to the gym and I was not mask masking and I'm fully vaccinated. Today, I'm really reconsidering whether I'm going to the gym at all. And if I go, I'm certainly masking. Things have changed. So, so I have indicated to my family we should be masking as much as possible indoors. This is for our safety and it's for the safety of others. So I think it's important that people understand this is different. This is not, we're not, restating something uh, that, that we've been stating for a while. The Delta variant has changed the game and we have to change our behaviors immediately. Um, not to put too fine a point out of it, but for SB 22, would you guys be announcing the mask mandate today? If it weren't for Senate Bill 22, would I be announcing a mask mandate today? It's very likely that I would, yes. And um, I have talked to um, the city attorney's office to see what our options are here in the city of Columbus. And I have been in discussion with the mayor's office and city council about what our other options might be, if necessary. I am very supportive of those businesses who have decided to make masking mandatory for their employees, like OSU, um, like Nationwide Insurance and others around town who have done that. So I encourage businesses for your safety of your employees, as well as your patrons and visitors, to do that yourself. But we are issuing the indoor mask advisory today. So the vaccines have been out there for about seven months. We're statewide, it's less than 50% of people have chosen to take them. Is it time for employers, schools, and universities to require vaccination, or is this an education campaign, not a policy campaign? Well, I'll take a stab, and then I'll be happy to see if any of my other colleagues want to do that. Um, as you know, many employers in Franklin County have already decided to make um, vaccines mandatory. And I am completely supportive of that. Um, we need to do whatever we can to maintain our economy here. And part of that is keeping our employees at work where they belong. And they can do that if they're vaccinated and if they're protected. So um, I think as other employers you know, think about this situation, I, I would strongly encourage them to go ahead and make that decision. And I also believe that once we get full FDA approval, we're gonna see more businesses make vaccine mandatory. Anyone else want to add to that? Go ahead. So you will have noticed that all of the healthcare organizations in Central Ohio are now requiring vaccination for all of their employees, contractors, volunteers, anyone who spends time in their buildings. We are doing this for the safety of our healthcare employees who you've already learned are in short supply. We're doing it for the safety of our community our patients that visit us. We're also doing it as a beacon of light for other businesses, organizations in Central Ohio who want to take the next step. You can take the next step. You can require this for your employees. And I think that I personally would encourage it. Indianapolis Star is reporting that one week into the student school year, three dozen students uh, have tested positive for COVID and are quarantining. Uh, these are mask optional schools. Uh, how much concern do you have about what's happening there to happen here as school approaches, number one? And number two, Dr. Herbert, you had been talking about masking outdoors as well. As OSU football season approaches and outdoor concerts begin to set up, are you telling people that everyone who attends those events should also be masking if they attend an outdoor event? Well, I'll take number two because I've already forgotten number one. But <laughs> my advice would be, you notice we're all masked here, except for the person who's actively speaking. So that's a message to the community. If you're in an outdoor environment that is a very close environment, whether it is a sporting event, whether it is a musical event, whether it is a religious event, you are placing yourself at increased risk. 
This is exactly the type of scenario that occurred in Cape Cod, Massachusetts a few weeks ago, where literally hundreds of people, many of them vaccinated, developed infection. Thank goodness there were very few severe infections. So I think if you're outdoors, it's the same way as crossing the street. If you know the light is green in your direction, but you look both ways and you see fast traffic coming, you will pause. So if you're entering a sporting event and you see everyone is standing and screaming and shoulder to shoulder and not masking, you should pause and consider whether that's a safe environment for you. To your question around schools and what's going on in uh, Indianapolis, I, it's, it's gravely concerning, frankly. I mean, our children lost a year of their academic, normal academic lives last year, and they, we did the best we could with homeschool and virtual school and partial school, but it was not the same. It impacted their development, it impacted their mental health. I am tremendously concerned as we go into another academic year that we could lose another year of normal, what could be normal school, normal socialization for those children. So it, that's why it is absolutely imperative that anyone who's eligible for the vaccine gets vaccinated and that we strongly move towards full masking, especially indoors and especially in schools. There is zero, zero downside to wearing a mask. That's what that's what makes it so difficult to uh, reconcile in my head. I know people have opinions. I know it's been politicized. There is no downside to wearing a mask. There's only upside potential for our students and for the teachers and those who work in schools. On that a little bit, but just talk about mask shaming. We're hearing that a little bit in school settings that kids are bullied because they're wearing a mask. Can you talk about that? You kind of are skirting on it. Yeah, but. so your question around mask shaming, it really is unfortunate that, that we have parents who are uh, protecting their children and asking them and requiring them to wear masks in schools. And then you have schools that say it's optional and other students shaming those students for doing what is the right thing to do. And, and that is unfortunate. And the only way we can really get around that is if we have more universal masking. And the easiest way to get around that from a child's perspective is to make it the policy. If you make it a policy and everyone has to follow it, then it's not a choice and there won't be shaming. There are profound impacts to these children, unfortunately, from their mental health and well-being all around COVID. So again, it's indirect to the children. They're not getting COVID, but they are dramatically impacted by it. And it's unfortunate because we're playing games with their lives. The one thing I would just add, and I think you all know that Columbus City Schools did make a statement a few weeks ago that they are going to require universal masking in all of their buildings. And I commend them on that decision that they made. I also just want to remind you from based on the guidance we have from last school year from ODH and we're waiting on updated guidance. But there are advantages to districts that have their students mask because if the students are masked and they're appropriately distanced from each other and there is a case in the classroom, which inevitably there will be a case in the classroom it allows those students to continue to come to class and they don't have to stay home and be quarantined if they're exposed to a case. Again, if they're in the classroom with a mask on and there's distancing in place. So there are clear advantages to districts as well as schools and families for everyone wearing a mask in those settings. People have done everything they've been supposed to advise to so far. They waited in line to get the vaccine. They stayed home last year. Why should they pick up that mask again, even though they've been doing everything so far in our vaccine there? Well, so the reason why we are recommending, not recommending, we are asking everyone to wear a mask indoors, whether they're vaccinated or not, is because individuals who are vaccinated, as well as those who are unvaccinated, can spread the virus. The mask is a protection for yourself as well as for others. And so I'm vaccinated. I go out. I'd say I'm protected. I'm not wearing a mask. But someone might be around me in the grocery store who is not vaccinated or who is vaccinated, but they're not wearing a mask and they sneeze or they cough or they start having a conversation with me. Um, they could spray respiratory droplets on me. I could inhale it and I could get sick. Now I'm vaccinated, I could have mild symptoms, but that still means that I can't go to work for a period of time. And it still means that I could spread that virus to my elderly mother who could get very sick if she gets infected. So there are risks to the individuals who are vaccinated as well. And so that's why they should mask up as well. We're not taking any of the liberties away. We're still allowing you to go to events. We're still allowing full capacity. We're just asking you to wear a mask when you're out indoors. Michika, can I add something? 
Sure, Andy. I think to just add to what uh, others have been saying and reiterate, th this variant of the virus has changed the game. We're seeing viral loads a thousand times higher than we saw with previous versions of the virus. And that's really what's led the CDC uh, and others uh, uh, that, that study the science to change the recommendation around those who are vaccinated needing to mask when they're indoors within close proximity of other people. That's the, to your point, people did line up and do all those things and they stayed home last year when we asked them to. They've done all those things we asked. Now the science has changed because the virus has changed. What we want to avoid is the virus changing again and getting even more contagious. Luckily, the, the way you catch the virus still is particles going from my mouth or my nose to your mouth or your nose. The difference is it takes a lot fewer particles to get the next person sick. And that is why we're really seeing vaccinated people getting these cases, breakthrough cases. It's rare, but it happens. And when it happens, we don't want those people then spreading that virus to those that are unvaccinated. So you've mentioned Senate Bill 22. You've mentioned that you guys have put out this guidance that all schools wear masks, but clearly some schools aren't listening. We're 18 months into this. Why, why do you think the public health community is still losing these political fights? Thank you, Dr. Roberts. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think we're losing the fight. I think, I think the public understands what the right thing to do here is. I think they understand, and it's because of all of our colleagues here, the risk that, that we're taking. I think, unfortunately, it has become political. Public health is not political. Public health is science-based. Public health is data-driven. Public health is about making recommendations, issuing guidance, and putting in policies that protect the, the general population. The recommendations we're talking about here this morning will do that. It'll keep kids in school, it'll keep employers open for business, and it'll keep people healthy. And I think the public understands that. We understand that there still is maybe a little bit of hesit hesitancy about the vaccine. We're working through that. It, you know, we're gonna continue that conversation. We're gonna continue to make sure that vaccine is available to anyone who's, will, who's ready to get vaccinated. But I don't think we're losing this conversation. I think, unfortunately, there have been decisions that have made that have limited our authorities and our abilities, but that's not going to stop us from continuing to engage with our community. Because right now, this is probably the most important part of this, of this response. When we have something uh, like the Delta variant that has certainly caused so much concern, and as, as we've heard, you know, so much uh, uh, really uh, pain and suffering for our families and our residents. Now is the time to continue to do all the things that we know work. And so that's what we're going to stay focused on moving forward. We're going to wrap up now, but I think we're all available for questions if any of you have one-on-one -on -one questions for us. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.